But there's another kind of disruption, which we've talked a little bit about earlier today, these sort of new market disruptions, and they take hold within an, a new value network, and we say that they compete against non-consumption. And what we mean by that is that there was no previous customer who was using the prior version of that product or service. Okay, so there's a need in the market, and nobody takes advantage of that need, either because the existing solutions are too complicated and too expensive. And if somebody can come in and offer a, a solution that is less complicated and less expensive, all of a sudden there might be a market there that, that didn't exist previously. So we say you compete against non-consumption. So things like the PC or Sony's uh, digital, uh, or the, Sony's transistor pocket radio are good examples of competing against non-consumption. Okay? So I want to give you a perspective on how we can use these ideas to think about different firms' approaches to the same industry, okay? So you can understand different firm strategies. So in the video game industry, you can tell I have young kids, right? So a lot of my examples are related to young kids. So in the video game industry, there's a, there's a very different perspective on how Sony approached this industry versus some other uh, companies. So Sony says, how can we make our product better for our best customers? Okay, in this case, the so-called core de gamer demographic. So you create ever better graphics, more intense gameplay, and what you have is you have teenagers who have twitchy fingers, absolutely love the PlayStation. All right, and then you say, well, what about, Nintendo says, you know, what about all the people in the world who currently don't consume any video game technology either because it's too complicated or too expensive. Create their Wii product so simple, so intuitive, that even my four-year-old daughter can play it, okay? And so now, what kinds of markets are we thinking about? What kinds of customer segments are we thinking about? Well, we're thinking about the so-called casual gamer demographic, which we didn't even know was out there prior to Nintendo. So we've got things like the very old and the very young, and families love playing it. So you can also think about healthcare, and in particular, a company called Minute Clinic. So Minute Clinic, whose nurse practitioner-based kiosks are popping up in retail locations across the country. In these kiosks, a nurse practitioner, not a doctor, can diagnose one of 20 common everyday ailments, things like an earache or a sore throat, and they can provide a diagnosis of that and also write you prescriptions so that you can get your prescription on the spot. Okay, now they can't diagnose every single ailment, but if you have one of these 20 very common everyday ailments, it's very simple, it's very fast, and you can be on your way. In fact, if you look at Minute Clinic's tagline, it's Minute Clinic, you're sick, we're quick. <laughs> not you're sick, we'll make you well, you're sick, we're quick. Disrupting the healthcare industry, not by doing it better along traditional dimensions, but by doing it differently. Okay, think about TurboTax whose web-based accounting software is disrupting personal tax preparation services like H&R Block. Now, TurboTax is clearly not good enough for people like my rich brother-in-law, who have many multiple investment properties and several offshore accounts, but it's good enough for a lowly professor like me, who doesn't know that much about accounting, to be able to do his taxes in about an hour. You can think about the newest version of Google Docs, which is definitely not as good as the newest version of Microsoft Word with all its bells and whistles, but it's good enough for many tasks and for what most people need. There's simple word processing and spreadsheets. It's easy to share. And of course, the price is right, right? It's available for free. Now, it's tempting to look into the future and get very, very excited. And we probably should, right? We've heard a lot about the future today. Uh, I've given you a couple more examples here. You know, we've got Amazon's drones that are going to deliver packages to you. You've got uh, Google Glass and other wearable technologies. You've got Facebook's Oculus virtual reality headset. But to me, it's unclear that any of these sort of gee whiz technologies are disruptive relative to how these firms actually make money. So Amazon wants to deliver more packages to you faster. Right? Google wants you to do more searches so they can book more ad revenue. And Facebook wants you to do, well, I mean, they want you to do whatever it is that you do on Facebook. But they want you to do more of it in a more immersive fashion and a more engaging fashion, right? Now, inst instead, what I want to do is I want to stick a little bit closer to the theory and to the concept and to give you a disruptive innovation perspective on three broad industries that people had variously described as disruption-proof. 
And what I like about these industries is they have many of the characteristics of the utilities business in the sense that many have said that these, these industries were disruption proof. So I'll start with financial services, and now certainly we have the, the rise of the low-cost brokerages in the mid-1990s, online low-cost brokerages, but if you look at, at the ways that we save and that we lend and that we invest, the primary companies in those primary categories are very similar today than what they were 20, 30 years ago. But there's certainly some change of folk, right? We're starting to see some online peer-to-peer -peer lending happening in the lending space. We're seeing some things happen in terms of online platforms for investment management. We're seeing some other things like digital currencies. Uh, but I want to give you a perspective on, on one company in particular called Wealthfront, which is a uh, software-based financial advisor, or what's been commonly referred to as a robo-advisor, which has recently transitioned to become a new market disruption, serving those who can't afford the high minimums of traditional financial advisors. And you say, well, why can't traditional financial advisors just lower their minimums? And the reality is, is that they can't. It doesn't work for their business model. And they are appealing to a fringe customer group. In this case, young technologists and engineers people who uh, are mistrustful of Wall Street, who very much trust algorithms to manage their money, and that have a little bit of money in their accounts from their companies that have been, their tech companies that have been acquired or that have gone IPO. Okay, we can also think about the hospitality industry. And you say, okay, well there's been lots in the mid, you know, 1950s, there was the emergence of these low cost hotel chains, the days ends of the world, the holiday ends of the world, but none of these low cost or budget hotel chains have ever moved up market and successfully challenged some of the higher end hotels like the Ritz Carlton and the Four Seasons. And it's for good reason, right? Because if you wanna challenge those hotel chains, then you need to add the kinds of service that the customers who to frequent those hotel chains are used to. And that's a high touch service that causes you to increase your own cost structure, okay? So we haven't seen that, but if you think about it, consider you know, Airbnb, right, which is a sharing service that allows people to rent out lodging, uh, started off offering short-term living quarters for people who couldn't afford a hotel or couldn't book one in a crowded market. You talk about an inferior product to hotel, it was people who were subletting their apartment for a little bit of extra money, people who were subletting their room, people who were subletting their couch Right? But it looks very attractive to somebody who can't afford a hotel or can't book one in a crowded market. But over time, they've improved their offering, right? They've added more features, more functionality, more technology. They've enhanced their business model. They've gotten to the point now where they have this sophisticated rating service. They have more than 500,000 listings in 192 countries, including on the bottom left, this $4,000 a night beach house in Australia and this $7,000 a night um, uh, villa in Florence, Italy. Now, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't take the ideas and apply them to my own industry, okay? So we've always heard higher education, right? There's no disruption possible. Uh, this is actually a quote from The Economist. Uh, Elite business schools still look like a fair deal. Few expect the luster of an MBA from Harvard, Wharton, or Stanford to fade. Schools that send a less sexy signal, though, may be in trouble. So um, while I, I like this quote, I respectfully disagree with it. This is, this is something that's happening at the Harvard Business School as we speak. It is a tremendously expensive place to get educated about management, and we admit about 900 students a year, and there's a tremendous amount of non-consumption. That means people who would like to learn about management but are not learning about management in traditional ways. And what we look at is we look adjacent to us at these other markets. We look at markets like uh, online learning, and we look at markets like corporate universities, and the market for management education in those markets is absolutely booming. And what we do is we look down our noses at it and we say, well, this isn't as good as Harvard, right? And I think that's the right answer to the wrong question. The right question is, is it getting better and better, and are we at risk of disruption?